Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome Professor Adam Porter from the University of Maryland. Adam and I go quite a ways back, uh, working together at uh, Bell Labs, and it's my pleasure to have him here talking to us about uh, his work on uh, test automation and uh, making uh, quality assurance uh, a more repeatable and scalable uh, methodology. Right, thanks, Tom. Okay, as Tom said, I'm Adam Porter. I'm at the University of Maryland. And today I'm going to be talking about some research that I and uh, my collaborators have been doing <clears throat> in which we're exploring tools and techniques for something that we call distributed continuous quality assurance. Um, so I, I probably don't need to tell you guys this, but um, you know, modern, by, all, by, all, uh, by all measures, uh, modern systems are getting larger and more complex. Uh, we've got lots of systems today that run on you know, numerous platforms, numerous combinations of platforms, compilers, libraries, uh, et cetera. They've got tens, hundreds, even thousands of configuration options. Um, we're finding more and more systems are being developed by distributed teams, uh, people working around the world to integrate, you know, components to, into uh, systems and systems of systems. Um, you know, these things are, are being integrated with uh, other frequently changing systems, uh, systems that have their own uh, timelines for the way they change. And, uh, and also people, I think, are taking a broader view of what uh, testing or quality assurance is really about. We're looking at more than just uh, not only correctness, but other issues of performance and, and things like that. And the question that we have is, you know, how do you scale up QA to systems like this? So when we um, talk to various people, uh, so, sort of some of the best practices or the kinds of things that we're, we're seeing happening uh, is some combination of, I guess, uh, ideas like test-driven development and continuous build integration and test. So basically the idea is we want to apply a, a wide and powerful variety of tests uh, at multiple levels of the system whenever the software changes. So a typical you know, use case of this kind of, uh, kind of approach is developers, you know, some developer wants to update the code, uh, he or she will check the code out, update it, perform some QA locally. Uh, if, the, if, that, uh, if those changes pass muster, they'll check the stuff back in. And that check-in will trigger some continuous build integration or CBIT process, uh, typically on the, the head of the repository, on the latest change itself. Okay. <clears throat> and so our assessment of this is that this process works reasonably well um, for a few QA processes on a very thin slice of the system. Okay, so um, on, on the on the positive side, we get an up-to-date picture of, of quality in the in the system. Uh, on the downsides, though, this 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 picture is often very narrow. This window into the system quality is, is typically very narrow. Uh, it's often focused only on uh, compilation and maybe some simple functional testing. Again, applied only to the head of uh, the CVS repository. And in particular, um, this this idea scales pretty poorly to today's complex and highly configurable systems. So uh, we find uh, because there are so many different combinations of configurations and things to look at that people either by default or on purpose uh, concentrate QA on the most readily available platforms, the ones that they sort of have you know, uh, within arm's reach, and typically focus on a, a very small number of default or popular uh, configurations. So you're looking at a, a very tiny bit of the system. Um, when we try to scale these, these uh, C-bit processes up, we, we often see people essentially replicating the servers. Um, but, but they're often uh, uncoordinated, right? So these machines are working uh, in isolation. You've got no sharing of knowledge, no sharing of artifacts, no sharing of the, of the QA effort and results across the multiple servers. So there's a lot of redundancy and wasted, wasted effort. Um, and also the, the processes themselves tend to be static and they don't learn over time. So we, we see things where um, tests are failing and the, the CBIT process will just keep running them uh, over and over and over again, even though there may be other parts of the system, other configurations, other platforms on which we uh, would be better off applying our efforts. Okay. Okay. So to, to to deal with some of these problems, we started looking into something that we call distributed continuous quality assurance, or DCQA. And our vision of this is to redesign QA processes so that they'll be conducted around the world, around the clock, uh, on powerful virtual com computing grids. And and by a grid, I mean in some cases, that might be a company-wide intranet. 
Okay, all the computers you can find on your company-wide intranet. It might be um, end-user machines. Okay, actual, you know, sort of what uh, the Microsoft Watson sort of approach. Uh, or it could be uh, running on a dedicated cluster of computers. So if you give us a grid, we'll try to spread the jobs out across, the, across that grid in an intelligent way. Um, the general approach, it's like a lot of distributed computations, we want to take a traditional process and chop it up into thousands, millions, whatever it is, uh, small tasks. And then we want to intelligently distribute those tasks to clients uh, who are out there on our grid. Those clients are then going to execute these tasks and then return the results to, to one or more servers. And we're, at the servers, we're going to merge and analyze those results, uh, hopefully to intelligently steer the process. Okay, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we, some of the ways in which we do that. Why do we want to do this? Um, basically, you know, we uh, massive parallelization. We want to get more work done faster, obviously. Um, by using these grids, we think we can get greater access to resources and environments that may not be readily found in-house. Okay? So especially in some maybe smaller sort of companies that don't have as maybe a broad a variety of, of test uh, platforms, that this might be a, a, a good reason to use this approach. Um, and also we'd like, to, by coord we'd like to coordinate our QA efforts so that we can do much more sophisticated kinds of analyses. Because we want to, we want to be you know, using our, our resources to the maximum effect uh, in order to, uh, to do more, more intelligent things. And the strategies that you'll see us coming back to over and over again as we implement these kinds of processes uh, is we're going we're to want to leverage developer and, app and application community resources so that we see a broader, broader usage, broader platforms, uh, uh, greater diversity in our tests. Uh, we want to maximize uh, test and resource diversity. Uh, we're going to try to opportunistically divide and conquer large analyses. So if you give us resources, we're going to use them. Uh, and we'll try to use them in the best way we can um, based on what shows up and is available to us. Uh, we're going to try to steer the process to improve its, effic its efficiency and effectiveness. And another uh, thing that we think is very important is we want to try to get away from this idea that um, QA is done on check-in. We want QA to be done continuously. So we want to be, uh, whether people are asking for the, the results or not, we want to be in the background computing uh, as much as we can about the system and, and, and not just saying, you know, yes, no, the system, you know, compiles, doesn't compile. We want to be gathering uh, information about our system, exploring our system, learning about our system all the time so that, uh, and doing that proactively so that when somebody comes in and has a particular question they want to answer, we can give them a very uh, a, a perceived rapid response because we've been doing a lot of work in the background, capturing a lot of, uh, doing a lot of work proactively. Okay, um, this work's been, in the, in, uh, been going on for, for a, a, a couple years now, and we've got lots of different collaborators, and we're always looking for more. Uh, we're doing work with people at Vanderbilt, Georgia Tech, the University of Nebraska, the National Institute of Statistical Sciences, uh, lots of folks at Maryland where I am. Um, and we're getting a lot of industrial um, uh, partnerships, and, and we're starting to work with various folks, Cisco, MySQL, Raytheon, JBoss, Lockheed, et cetera. And you know, hopefully, hopefully we'll get some more, uh, uh, more people as we go, go forward. Okay, let me kind of jump a little bit into the main part of the, the talk. I'm going to start by saying a little bit about um, our system that we call SCOL, which is a DC, inf uh, DC QA infrastructure and approach. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of, of an idea of how that actually works. And then I'm going to, from there, go into some specific DC QA processes that we've built to leverage this, this approach, and then just give a, a couple conclusions and, and ideas of future work. So let me give you the simple, the simple picture here. And I think it's, it's pretty obvious, but I'll just go through this. Um, also, uh, for people watching, I've got some, some references to, uh, to papers and things that um, people can, can uh, look up if they need more information. Uh, you can also uh, check out our website here, uh, www.csumdedu slash project slash skull. And that has some more, um, or my personal website, uh, tilde a. Porter at csumd.edu. OK, um, so we've got here some set of servers over here and some clients running out in our, in our grid out in the world somewhere. Uh, what we do is we ask the clients to register with us and then we, they will, we will give them something called a client kit. So this is a piece of software that's going to have implementations of services that they will need to carry out uh, to ev uh, eventual DCQA processes. Um, when the client decides that uh, it's available to do some work for us, uh, it will send us a request. It will say, hey, I'm out here. I'm ready to work, and it will tell us a little bit about itself. I'm a Linux box. I've got this much memory. I've got these compilers installed. Um, this is some stuff we set up beforehand to give us a, to help us uh, understand what services or what what characteristics is providing to us. Our server is then going to um, try to select the best outstanding. 
QA task that matches those client requests. So there's a little bit of opportunistic matching here. Um, if we, you know, if, if this is a, a totally um, proprietary grid that we control, maybe we do need to do a little bit less matching. If we're more in a, in a broader end user type environment, the matching becomes more important. Okay, we're going to send a, a task to the client. The client will execute that task and return the results to us. And then the server will basically update its internal databases, et cetera, et cetera, and so that when new clients come in, we will then continue this process to keep trying to match and keep trying to give the next best task to the, the incoming clients so that we can meet our, Q, our overall QA process goals. Okay, how do you implement some of these, uh, these DC QA processes in Skull? So there's two main things you need to do. The first thing that we need to do is to define how we're going to divide the QA analysis into pieces, okay? And we do that by defining what we call generic uh, QA tasks. Uh, and we're going to then define a QA space in which those tasks operate. So the tasks themselves are going to be sort of templates. They're going to be generic tasks that are parameterized by configuration, where configuration for us um, means basically whatever variable information is needed to execute the concrete task. So it could be information about what operating system you're running. It could be information about um, you know, other kinds of configuration options for the system, runtime policies, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, the QA space then is going to be the set of all valid configurations in which one of these tasks might run. Okay? So we've got uh, a space of configurations. We have tasks that can be applied to any point in the configuration space. And then what we want to do then is to define the process by writing what we call um, something that we call uh, navigation strategies. And the navigation strategies are basically, you can think of them as visitors that basically walk around the QA space applying the generic tasks, uh, uh, gathering up the information, merging and analyzing it, et cetera, and continue the process of, of walking around the, the configuration space. So that's our generic model of how we implement Q, uh, DC QA processes in Skull. Let me give you some examples uh, of those things. So we've, doing, we've, we've been doing a lot of work with a system called AceDAO and Chow. It's um, um, over 2 million lines of code, open source, CORBA implementation. It's got three levels. There's the ACE layer, which is low-level networking services, DAO, which is a CORBA implementation, and then CHOW, which is a componentized CORBA implementation that allows you to do some, uh, some uh, setting of various um, uh, Q, uh, quality of service properties. So it's maintained by about 40, more than 40 geographically distributed core developers, plus lots of other guys who add l uh, little bits of changes uh, here and there. 20,000 users around the world is a product line architecture with over 500 configuration options. Uh, and it runs on, it's expected to run as a communications software, middleware, it's expected to run over dozens of OS and compiler combinations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, at peak times, it's, con it's uh, continuously evolving. It experiences over 200 CVS commits per week, okay, which is basically one per hour on a continuous basis. Um, and the quality concerns are like we said before, multifaceted. They're, they're uh, issues of correctness, quality of service, memory footprint, compilation time, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a number of uh, quality aspects that we want to manage about this system. Okay. Uh, remember we said the first thing we had to do was to define a QA space. So this is just a little sample of a piece of it that we did for some work. So we wanted to know about the operating system. So we, have some compile, we have some compile time options. Uh, operating system. Which features are, are compiled in or out of the system? So there's this DAO has minimum CORBA and there are other kinds of services that may be compiled in for a full version and compiled out for an embedded, app, uh, an embedded implementation or uh, instantiation. There are runtime policies. Okay? There are things like various kinds of uh, optimizations and runtime policies. Uh, the, systems, the, the, the component systems have multiple versions that we may want to mix and match various versions. Uh, we also include uh, options for the tests themselves. So the test suite has tests that, uh, that can run on certain configurations and are not supposed to run on other kinds of configurations. And we need to be able to model that as well. Um, now, so once we have the set of all the different uh, options and the option settings, um, we also, it also turns out that not all combinations of these option settings are valid. All right? Uh, and a good, a good example was you know, some tests are not meant to run on certain implementations. So uh, this test here uh, is, is, uh, not, uh, does not run when not DAO has minimum CORBA. So if you have a, uh, if you do, if you have, if you have, um, you need to have more than the minimum CORBA implementation in order to run this test because it uses more advanced services. 
Okay? And there's some other things that if you want support for asynchronous message invocation, uh, you must also have more than the minimum core of implementation. So there are some, there are some connections and constraints among the various settings, and we have to model those as well. Okay. Um, generic tasks. So I'm just going to give you kind of a, a very high-level overview. This is actually implemented as a, as a giant XML file, but um, what we really are doing is telling the client kit, uh, we're giving the client a workflow of services, a description of a service workflow that says, uh, these are the things I would like you to do. And those services are implemented in that client kit that we, we distributed out when, they, when the client registered. Now, we have some built-in services, uh, logging, CVS download, uploading the results. Most of the interesting things you want to do have to be provided by the, the project itself. So the, the, the project-specific make files, you've got to give them to us. We don't do those automatically. Okay? Um, so for example, if we want to run a test suite, um, we may have a service a workload that, that looks like this. Uh, you know, enable the logging, define which component you want to be built, set some configuration options and environment variables, download the source, configure and build the components, compile the tests, execute the tests, upload the results to the server. And this is really dependent on the actual QA process that you want to, that you want to run. Okay. So our first steps were to find the QA space, to find generic tasks that can run in that QA space, and now we have to figure out how we're going to actually walk the configuration space applying this process to get us some interesting results. So what I've got here is a representation of a small piece of the ace Dao and Chow uh, configuration space. And, and what we're looking at here is just, does the system compile under certain static configuration options? Each of these points here is meant to represent one valid configuration. And I have uh, drawn it an arc between any two configurations that differ in the value of exactly one option. Okay, So we're going to call these distance one neighbors. All right. Uh, now what we'll do here is start off, clients are coming in and saying, uh, hey, I'm here to do some work. What would you like me to do? So we give this guy this configuration. We give it to some client. We say, build this and tell me if it passes. And it, let's say it passed through a marketing green. That guy, he came in, he, he asked for a configuration. We gave him another one that was in green. And now this other one, it was gonna, uh, we gave this configuration to somebody, and it failed. So now we're going to mark this one in red here in, in this picture. Um, what we then do is we go through our configuration model and we compute all the distance one neighbors of this failing, this failing uh, configuration. And what we're going to then do is make these new configurations high priority tests. So if a client comes in who can execute these configurations, we will give them to them first. If not, we'll go randomly select something else. Okay? And then the idea is we're going to continue to spider out and, for example, this guy will, you know, when he fails, we'll mark his neighbors as high priority. Uh, this guy, he passed, so we will not mark his neighbors as high priority. We're going to stop at that point, all right, and we're going to continue going. And the idea here is hopefully uh, we're going to quickly bound the space of the failing configurations, this, this failing subspace. Okay? And um, I'll talk later about how we use this information, but uh, again, the idea here is to sort of zoom in. Uh, when we see a failure, we're going to zoom in on it explore that area, okay? Um, and an extension that we added to this was let this, this subspace that's failing could be very large, okay? So if we can through, for example, machine learning techniques uh, decide what the characteristics of this failing subspace are early, okay? Uh, what we can do is basically um, negate those, negate the characterization and put it back into the model and tell the, and tell the, um, the um, uh, the navigation strategy, this now is off limits. Don't generate any more configurations that are in this space because we already know they're broken. We don't need to keep running them. We know they don't work. Go out here in some other area where we still need information and start exploring there. Okay? So this is one way in which we, we've used this, this, uh, this, this, this sort of overall model to get an interesting process. Uh, okay, so that was just sort of a high level picture. Let me, let me jump into some, some uh, more detailed examples and show you what we've done. So the first uh, case study I'll talk about is, is uh, aimed at trying to characterize what I call configuration related faults. So we want to help developers localize uh, faults that are due to specific settings of the configurations. All right, so what we do is we're going to strategically sample the QA space to test for subspaces in which bad things happen, in which compilation fails or in which regression tests fail. Okay? And once we've done that, 
uh, we're going to then use some machine learning type techniques to build models that characterize what it is about that, that uh, uh, what options and, and specific settings of those options define the failing subspace. And so the idea here is I want to give the developer um, as quickly as possible a piece of information that says when this is true and this is true and this is true about your configuration, you get this error message. When this is true and this is true, you get this other error message. Okay, so we want to give them, not only do we want to detect the failure, we want to try to characterize it and give this hopefully actionable information to the developers so that they can you know, at, least, uh, at least figure out what they can ignore in looking for this problem. Okay? Uh, so our sampling strategy, step one. Uh, we, want to, we want to maximize the coverage of the option setting combinations. We want to minimize the number of configurations tested. So our approach is going to be to compute a test schedule uh, using something called uh, T-way covering arrays. And T-way covering arrays are just uh, a set of configurations in which all ordered T-tuples of the option settings appear at least once. So we're going to try to cover up to T-way interactions in the, in the um, configuration space. So here's an example of a two-way uh, uh, two covering array. So let's say we've got a system with three options. 01, 02, and 03, and they take uh, three values each, 0, 1, and 2. So there are, in this whole space, there are 27 possible configurations. If you look at these nine that we've picked here, what you'll see is that if, if uh, this is a two-way covering array. So if I look at any two options, all possible combinations of those, uh, of those settings appear here. So I've got 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 0, 2, 1, 2, 2. I look at 02 and 03. 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 0, 2, 1, 2, 2, and the same holds for 01 and 03. Okay? So with just nine configurations, I've looked at all two-way combinations of these option settings, and so in some sense I'm trying to just get, uh, cast a broad net uh, to, to look at as, as my seed points here. Okay? Um, once, uh, once we've actually executed these things and we've got the data back, we're going to use some, some uh, machine learning techniques. In this case, we use classification trees to try to model the options and settings that best predict failure. So this basically says, you know, when CORBA messaging is, is, is uh, disabled and uh, asynchronous message, messaging invocation support is disabled, you get error message number three. When messaging is disabled and AMI is enabled, you get error message number one, et cetera, et cetera. So we can build these models and give them to developers and say, here's where uh, you're seeing some problems, and this is our best guess at what's, you know, where these problems are occurring in your configuration space. So uh, we did a, a little feasibility study, and our scenario that I'll talk about here was looking at a, a regression test. So we had a set of about 100 regression tests, and we want to know, do these regression tests pass in all possible runtime and static configurations uh, in this subset of Ace, Dao, and Chow? So we picked a, a subset. We had about 40,000 valid configurations. They included things like compile time options. There were 10 of those with 12 constraints. We had 96 test options with 120 constraints. We have six runtime options, no constraints. We did it on two operating systems. And all told, we had about 40,000 um, 40, uh, configurations. And then we, we looked at two different navigation strategies. One, the nearest neighbor approach I talked about earlier. And a second one was this uh, T-way covering array approach um, uh, that, that, that we, I, I just finished talking about. And in reality, you could, of course, mix and match these things, too. You could start out with some seated, with a test schedule, and search around them when you find problems or whatever. But we're just going to look at these in isolation here. So we applied this to one release of ACEDAO and Chow using a, um, uh, an evaluation grid that we've set up at Maryland. We've got about 120 CPUs uh, in, a, in a computing cluster that we, that we use specifically for this research. Um, the exhaustive process, excluding compilation, is about 19,000 hours of com uh, uh, computing time. And here we're going to sh show some of the results that we had in terms of size for the different T-way covering arrays. So if we want just two-way options, we can, actually, uh, we can actually look at all the T-way options of this, um, in this space with only 116 configurations. So we can throw out about 99.5% of the configurations, and we still cover all the two-way interactions. Uh, Three-way interactions, you know, we can throw out 98 percent. Four-way interactions, 93. Even up to five, we can throw away up to about 82 percent. Um, once we get up to about six, we're not we're not saving as much, but there's still there's still uh, some value there. Okay. Some sample results. Uh, we found uh, about about 89 uh, what I call possibly option-related uh, failures. 40 of those were on Linux. 49 on Windows. Um, 
an interesting point. The models that we built based on the covering arrays, even, even with t equals 2, even when we threw out 99.4% of the, the uh, configurations, the models were nearly as good as those we had with exhaustive testing. So it was very interesting. We could detect and characterize faults with a very, very limited amount of information, which was a very, very interesting uh, uh, result there. <laughs> Um, some other things we saw: several tests fail, uh, even though they don't, even though they, they don't fail with default option settings. So this is kind of uh, um, kind of points out that if you're not looking broadly at your configuration space, you are missing you are missing faults. Okay. Um, another one that was very funny was some tests failed on every single configuration, even though they never, even though they don't fail on when using default options. So it turns out there was actually a bug in the option processing code. So as soon as you put something on the, on the, the, the command line, that kicked the option processing code that screwed something up that then caused some failures. So again, these, these sort of weird things can be hiding in places where if you're just focusing on you know, sort of the standard default build, the standard uh, platforms, you may not see them. And again, this just sort of gave us some, some more sense that uh, there was some value in trying to do a broader coverage of your configuration space. Uh, another interesting one, we had uh, three tests that failed, I think it was like 99% of the time, when a particular runtime optimization called orb co-location was set to no. Well, what does that mean? Well, uh, orb co-location says, when can two objects in this CORB application um, talk to each other directly by using the function calls as opposed to talking over, over the network? Uh, so if you're global or per orb, then objects, uh, some objects can, can communicate directly. If you say no, then that forces all objects to talk over the network. And if, so when, when you forced objects to, all objects to talk over the network, we saw bugs. When you allowed some to talk directly, the bugs went away. Okay? So basically, this, this clues you in that there's some, something about how you're sending me messages over the network is the problem. And in fact, the developers were able to find out that it was a problem with marshaling and unmarshaling the data um, fairly quickly. So again, this, this idea that this really helped developers, this characterization helped developers quickly narrow in on where the, where the cause of the fault was. Uh, and there was, some, again, some extra value in doing this. Yes? Can I ask you a question about the previous slide? Yes. So oh, how many, so total, how many tests were considered in that, that study? OK. Like you said about 100 or something? So, so our regression test suite had 96 tests in it. Although it turns out that not all tests can run on all configurations, uh, so I'd have to go back and actually look at the, the exact number. And, and how, do you remember how many of them they, how many of them failed? So for some configuration? Yes, uh, I can show you the, the specific data in the, in, the, in, the, um, uh, in the paper. I don't have the, the exact numbers on, in front of me. What we, tend, what we tried to do is to focus on those that failed at least about, I think it was a, a cutoff of about 2% of the time. Our, our, our general rationale was if you had something like basically five options, uh, sort of a five-way effect that appeared some percentage of the time, 2% would, would sort of explain that. Okay? So things that appear once in, uh, in, in 40,000 configurations, we really can't say that's a, con a configuration-related problem. It could be anything, and we're not really considering those. Okay? Uh, but I can show you the data offline. I, don't, I just don't have the numbers on the top of my head. But uh, we have, for, for every single test, we know exactly how, ma how many times it failed or didn't fail. Um, and there are a couple uh, that fail once or, you know, once or twice or you know, whatever um, that we're not including here. Uh, but I think something like, you know, again, it's in the 90s, 90s very high 90% of the, the failures are attributed to these 89, can be attributed to these 89 things that we saw here. But there, were, there still are a small number that occur for seemingly random reasons that might really be anything. Okay? And those ones we're not going to be able to find with this. Uh, we're not really going to be able to reliably find those with this technique. But I don't think anybody is. So, um, OK, partial summary. Uh, at this point, we've got the basic infrastructure in place and working. Our initial results are encouraging. Uh, we defined large control spaces and performed complex QA processes across them. We found many test failures that correspond to real bugs, some of which that the Ace and Dow and Chow guys hadn't found, uh, which was nice. Uh, the developers were, were very pleased that the fault characterization helped them to speed up debugging time, which we liked. Uh, another thing that was just uh, amazing to watch was the, it was the actual process of documenting and centralizing what configurations were actually valid in this system uh, was just amazing. Because it turns out that there are, uh, every time we did this, there would be fights among the developers about what was actually legal not, or not legal. And we found out that people were not writing code for configurations that were actually legal because they believed them not to be, not to be legal. 
people were actually leaving out uh, paths. And people were writing complex code to handle configurations that didn't actually exist. Or they couldn't actually exist because they were, they were, you know, um, they were illegal. So uh, again, this, this lack of, uh, and, and maybe this, is, this happens more frequently in an open source type project where sort of all the, the information is distributed you know, around the world. But I think it happens in other places as well. Um, but uh, we found this to be a, just a fascinating side benefit uh, that we hadn't really, hadn't really thought about before, uh, but, it was, but it was very good. OK, so uh, some ongoing things that we're doing. Uh, we're, we think we're ready to go live with this. So we're, we're looking at uh, this ACEDAO Chow system. And we're also starting to talk with uh, uh, people at MySQL. So we want to use SCOL to drive the, the CBIT process for these, these things and basically be running this live where the stuff I talked about with, uh, with ACEDAO Chow was, was offline and, and not part of the main, the main build. Um, other things that we're, we're getting a lot of interest in is um, our approach now assumes that clients uh, are fixed, right? Whatever characteristics they provide, OS, libraries, whatever, are fixed and we're not going to touch them, okay? And that sort of came from a mindset of thinking that we were distributing jobs to end users where we weren't going to be able to touch their machines. Um, we're getting a lot of interest from companies to do this inside of, you know, dedicated resources where they can actually, you know, physically reconfigure the, the systems if they want or use platform virtualization things like Xen or VMware or whatever uh, and do some sandboxing. So we're going we're gonna to start looking into that. In particular, trying to pay attention of how much it costs to actually do the reconfiguration so that we um, do the best job of, of managing, um, you know, getting more tests done with less reconfiguration, et cetera, et cetera. In particular, for some of our, um, uh, uh, well, with, well, the guys we're talking with at Cisco in particular, where the power consumption is, is, a, is a serious issue. Um, and they have to reconfigure the networks, et cetera. This, this is something that we're starting to look at. So there's some interesting, interesting issues that are popping up there. OK, uh, second case study. Um, we're gonna, uh, so the first one had to do with, with what I'll call with functional testing. But these same ideas can be used also for performance issues, right? So again, looking at these Ace and Dow and Chow folks, um, they want to be able to quickly determine when a software update or whether a software update broke performance. I've changed the code, and now uh, you know, I used to get, I don't know, 10,000 transactions a second. Now I get four. That's bad, right? I want to be able to detect that quickly and know that I did something uh, wrong. So our approach to doing this is to try to compute a, a cheap and reliable estimator of performance across the entire configuration space. So I want to find a, a, a cheap way to say, this is what the, the, you know, to estimate the performance across the whole space, and then I'll know if we've, if we've broken something. So the way we do this is we, we built something, a process we call reliable effect screening. And it has two threads, a proactive thread and a reactive thread. So what we do is we compute a formal experimental plan. Uh, we use something called screening designs. Other approaches could be used as well. But the idea is we want to we want to find out what are the key options or the key driving option or the key options that basically define the performance uh, the performance distribution across the entire uh, configuration space. We'll then execute this experimental plan across our QA grid, analyze the data, identify the important options, and then go back and keep recalibrating these. Uh, as the system is changing, okay. Um, now, hopefully, this is this this activity here is going to give us a, a small set of options that give us a good estimator. When the software then actually changes, we will benchmark just those combinations of the key options and the key interactions, um, and we're going to call that the screening suite. And we'll basically just randomize any other options, okay. So what we've decided from this part here was that these other options are effectively noise. The ones we have to pay attention to are this ones in the screening suite. So we'll do that. Uh, and that will give us a, an estimated performance distribution across the entire space. And we'll just compare that to what we had before. And if we see distributional changes, we know we did something wrong. Okay. So feasibility study, we again, looking at ACEDAO and Chow, they were, they were updating uh, their message queuing strategies. They wanted to know if they degraded performance. The developers gave us 14 potentially important binary options. So we had about 16,000 possible configurations. Um, and they captured various, various issues about you know, ways the threads are, uh, jobs are queued on threads, when you purge uh, some of the queues, concurrency models, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so we, we sort of attacked this in, in, a, couple, uh, in a, couple point, uh, a couple pieces. Uh, so first of all, this is the full data set. So looking at all 16,000 whatever configurations, we have this, uh, this graphic, which is called a half normal plot. I won't explain all the details, but basically um, important options will, will, get, will lie above the, the, the um, y equals 0 line. Um, the ones that don't really have any effect will be 
on the y equals 0 line. Okay? So what we see here is that options b, j, uh, i, c, and f, so b and j clearly have an important effect. i, c, and f have an arguably important effect. Okay? Um, the rest are noise. We then come up with our 128-run uh, screening design. Okay? Uh, and we can basically, we, we benchmark those 128. And what you can see is we can basically recapture the key effects um, using just 128 carefully chosen runs. All right? So this is what we would be doing in the background, computing these you know, screening designs, finding out the key, the key options. And then this, is just, this, is just, uh, this check here just shows us that we actually, this, this part actually worked. Okay? Now, let's, uh, now what we'd want to do in practice is take those key options and benchmark just those and compare that to what we, and, and hopefully that's going to be a good estimator for what we would have gotten if we benchmarked everything. So what we've done is we've taken the actual, all of the data where we actually did run them all and benchmark them all, and compared that to the screening suite. Uh, in, in this case, we were five options, of five binary options, so there's uh, 32 um, configurations here. And then we, we plot the quantiles of both distributions, and, and the, the key point here is that if they're the same, they're going to lie on the 45 degree line. Okay, so what you see here is that the, the distribution we get from using the screening suite with just 32 uh, configurations is pretty well, pretty well tracks what we would have gotten from doing the, the 16,000. Okay, so again, so the point here is that the, the screening suite did, does give us a good uh, estimate of what we'd have gotten if we'd have benchmarked the whole so, thing. So there are 32 points there? Yes. And, and I'm not quite sure what's the comparison is. So, so we took the 16,000, we basically find the, the, the third percentile, the sixth percentile, the ninth percentile. We, you know, we sort of look at 32, 32 points okay. in, in the distribution there of the full data set, and then we, we, we um, basically uh, line those up against each other. So if the, if the bottom, you know, if the, the, three, the, the bottom quartile here was whatever, you know, 82, I, I, I don't even remember now what the, what the units were, but it's 82 here, and it's 82 in the full set. Okay, uh, and and the the point is that those things you know if they are the same, they should roughly lie along that forty five degree line. So, um, I just don't yeah I don't know what a QQ plot is really. So you're you've got this huge data set, and you want to see how much variance there is in that huge data set compared to the. So samples. imagine like a box plot, right? Yeah, right? So box plot just gives you effectively gives you the twenty fifth percentile, the fiftieth, the seventy fifth, and and puts it there. Yeah. So now imagine another one that has, you know, the 3, 6, 9, 8, you know, I mean, 12, et cetera, right, uh, up to, you know, 100, yeah, okay. right? So, you just, so you're, just sort of, you're just writing down where, uh, you know, for the, third, the, for the third percentile of this data, what value does it have? Uh -huh. 27. The sixth percentile, 31, okay. right, whatever it is, okay? And we're just going to, those are just the numbers we have. That's our distribution. And you do for both distributions, okay? And then we're just gonna, and then those are on the same, the same, uh, the, the same units, right? right. So then we just, so if they're the same, they should line up right along the 45 degree line, okay? Good, good. All right. Um, so what we showed up to that point was we can find these key options, the screening suite that's small. We can benchmark it; it's a good estimator. Now we wanted to say, well, if we actually applied this to the, or the real evolving system, would we have detected problems in the real system? So we went back to the release that we looked at, and we, we got, um, uh, by I think it was 14 nightly snapshots okay, from the system, uh, at the, basically at the, from the point at which we, we, had, we had done our work. All right. uh, and this is the actual data. This is what really happened on a day-by-day -day, you know, re reconstruction of, of uh, the, the ACE-DAO uh, development process. And what you can see here is that basically on the, on the 12th here, or sorry, the 9th of, of December, Performance is sort of here. It starts to creep up on the 11th, 12th, 13th, and on the 14th, it really gets out of whack. Okay, our approach um, can detect or did detect the change here. Okay, uh, on the first day it went a little bit out of whack, whereas the Ace and Dow guys only knew about the change on the 14th when things really got out of out of whack. Uh, also, going back to their uh, their Bugzilla databases, uh, we find out that th that they thought the change was about 5%. And they only knew about it because people started to complain. All right? So the Ace and Dow guys found out about it because people started to send them angry emails. Uh, and their estimate was that the problem was only about 5% shift in latency. Okay? 
uh, where in fact it's actually about 50%, and our, our approach captures that uh, much more closely than, than, than they do. Okay? So we were able to detect the shift in the distribution earlier and more precisely than they did in their own, uh, in their own uh, efforts. Okay? Uh, so we think that's a nice uh, validation of the, the approach. Okay, partial summary at this point. So our reliable effect screening is an effective, we think it's an effective, efficient, and repeatable approach to estimating performance impact of software updates. Uh, it was effective in detecting actual performance degradations on real data. Uh, the thing that we think is most important here is in this particular example, it cut benchmarking time by a factor of 1,000. So it went from, uh, again, with very simple benchmarks, something that would have taken two days of CPU time to something that took five minutes of CPU time. And the, the cool thing about this is now this, this can become part of the check-in sequence. Okay, we don't have to do anything special and set up a special you know, process. Uh, our approach, because it's doing the hard work in the background, um, can then you know can then run a quick a quick check in, in a couple minutes as part of the the, um, uh, the check-in process and I think that's a really nice thing. So some ongoing work we're doing we're working with some statisticians at the National Institute of Statistical Sciences uh, coming up with some new designs that allow us to look at more deeply into the interaction space um, uh, more cheaply. Okay, so our our, our uh, screen design approach works well but has some limitations. So we're looking at some new experimental design techniques to deal with that. Um, we're also starting to look with um, some other companies about uh, looking at component-based systems. So we have multiple components, and we want to, uh, and there are inter and there may be interactions among the different components, but nobody actually knows that or knows how to deal with that, right? So um, you know, you may have a, uh, the top layer of the system has some op some option that needs to be set, but it's only going to work if you coordinate that with the change at, at some much lower level um, uh, configuration option on a lower level component. And we want to be able to identify those and pick those out so we can help end users do optimizations. Sorry, I, I, I'm not sure I, I fully understand the, the point on cut benchmarking work by a thousand times. Is it, is it essentially, why is it so? Because Is it essentially because of the fact of this, the grid infrastructure that you're using, the prioritization? No, no. so, so the, so the um, uh, I, I'm doing actual work, not elapsed time here, right? The, the, the issue is to, to know what the full distribution is, you have to do 16,000 runs of these benchmarking things, okay? Whereas with ours, you only need to do 32, oh, okay. okay? So um, again, ignoring, this is sort of back of envelope calculation, ignoring, you know, compilation times and, you know, whatever, okay? Um, which I think actually would make it even worse uh, for, for the exhaustive, obviously. Um, you know, we can go down to something that says, look, just, just benchmark these, these 32 things here, um, not 16,000. Okay, and, and so the, so the, the uh, and actually in, in the paper that we wrote on this, you know, if you just pick 32 at random, you're not going to get a reliable estimate, right? So the, 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 the important point is that we find which 32 need to be, need to be looked at, and, and we focus on those, okay? Did you find over time that that 32 changed, like when you were doing your tracking? Did you need to, did you need to substantially update which options? For, for the ones we did, we did not need to do that, okay? But, but, but we did not look at it long enough mm -hmm. to, to really say anything for real. And that's one of the things we'd like to do. So one of the issues about, about going live with the, you know, the ASDAO and the MySQL and stuff like that is we think this is going to generate a database for us oh, sure. where we can actually actually try some of these things out over a year time scale or two years or something. Um, and that's, um, and that, so we're actually really excited about that. But we, we really need to do that otherwise we can't make these, these, um, these right, claims. So I had a new option and that has some major performance impact. Or exactly. You know, the point of turning the option on is to enable some optimization, and then you then I want to know sort of now over the test suite, how does that interact with other options? Absolutely. I sort of want to get an impact, a performance impact assessment. Absolutely. So you could, you could use your 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 whole infrastructure for for get, for letting me sort of get a summary of the performance impact. Absolutely. In fact, um, in 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 some work we've done uh, with Ace and Dow guys again, uh, we did see the option the importance of options change unexpectedly. And it was actually a, a great alarm that there was a bug, right? Because, because that, that, those options were not intended to, and they should have still been as important as, as they were after the update as, as before. And somebody had mucked up something you know, bad, and it, it actually caused the, the importance of the options to shift. And that was sort of an, a, second, you know, a second piece of information, another alarm that went off and said, hey, something bad just happened. Look at this more carefully. Would you agree that perhaps Intuitively, uh, you can have such a big reduction in the number of uh, configuration that you check for, especially for performance. Because perhaps I don't know the application, but there are a few basically critical options that define basically what's the being of the overall performance. 
while for correctness, so to speak, the previous study, then it's perhaps harder to predict which one. I don't be, do you agree with that? I think, I think that's right. I mean, I don't have any, um, I don't have any theoretical you know, proof of that, right? But the other thing, too, is I mean, at some level, at some level, you know, you're, you're going to explain the, I mean, statistically, you're going to explain the effects that are out there with, you know, some number of options. I mean, at some point, you just, you know, when you start getting into the, the, the 100 order effects, they just can't be so large, right? Um, you know, you're going you're gonna to have seen a lot of that stuff at the lower levels, okay? So I think, I think even statistically, there's, there's, there's some reason to believe that, you know, at some reasonably low level uh, of options, we're going to have most of the information we need to do this problem. And I, I was mentioning this to Tom earlier. Um, we're not necessarily saying you're going to get a perfect, you know, perfect correspondence here, but we're hoping to get a, a, a close enough picture that we can do a quick, this quick and dirty check that says, hey, something went wrong, right, or something didn't go wrong. So I think this, I think this actually has a lot of legs. Uh, it can be used in a lot of different ways, and we're, again, we're still working to explore some of that stuff. Let me, let me do one more, one more little piece here of, hello, come back. I'm not getting any. Uh... Oh, yes, I am. Okay. So, so let me do the full third piece here that we're doing. So the first two things, one was functional, one was performance related. They were both in terms of configurations. Okay. So now we're going to look at some stuff where we, we use this skull idea to, to sort of dig deeper into some code level issues. Um, so our goal here of this, what we call code level fault modeling, is to automatically gain code level insight into why specific, why and when specific faults occur in the field. So we want to try to do something to figure out you know, what paths or data values or whatever are, being, are correlated with failures that we see out there in the field on end user machines. So our approach is going to be to lightly instrument those instances, deploy and execute them to users out there in the world, capture data back, what we'll call out, uh, outcome labeled profiles sim in the sim most simplest form, pass or fail. Okay? These runs passed, this run failed. Here's some profile data we got on these runs. And then we're going to try to build some models that explain those outcomes in terms of that profile data. And hopefully this gives us some clues about where bugs are hiding in, in the code. All right. The approach that we're going to take is uh, to do what we call lightweight instrumentation via adaptive sampling. So there's two things we have to look at. Um, our goal here is we want to minimize overhead. Uh, we, want, we don't want a lot of runtime slowdown. Uh, we would prefer not to rewrite the code too much, not to, have a lot, no, not to generate a lot of code bloat in the code. Um, we'd like to reduce the amount of data that we're sending between the end users and our central servers, and hopefully also to limit analysis costs of the data that comes in. So our approach uh, is going to use an incremental, we're going to use an incremental data collection approach where we, where individual instances will sparsely sample uh, the measurement space. So if you have a thousand points you want to measure in this program, we're going to have each instance measure 5%, 1%, something like that. Okay? Initially, the, the, the selection of, of, the sam of which measurements to sample will be uniform. It, so it's essentially just random, uniform random sampling. But over time, we're gonna, as data comes back, as instances report to us, we're going to update those weights uh, favoring measurements that have given us good, good predictions, good uh, measurements that tell us something about whether the, the run pass or failed. And we're going to essentially tamp down the ones that, uh, or downgrade the weights of the measurements that don't give us any good information. And over time, we, th we hope that the useful measurements will essentially bubble up, will be sampled more frequently, and the ones that are less useful won't. Okay. Now, the, the, the issue there is if you do this approach uh, and you only have you know, 10 to 5 to 1% of the, the, the measurements sampled in any run, uh, most, of the data that, most of your data set is going to be empty, right? You're gonna, most of the runs will have, have not collected data on most of the uh, data point, uh, most of the, the measurements, and that's problematic for, for many uh, typical learning algorithms. So we came up with a new learning algorithm we'll call association trees. And basically what we do is for a, a measurement range, we basically split it into two pieces, low or high, where <laughs> k is some statistically determined best cut point. And then we're going to convert these data items back to items that are present or missing. So if, if a particular measurement uh, m gives us a value that's less than k, we say low is present and high is missing. Uh, if it's higher than k, then high is present and low is missing. And if we never measured at all, then low is missing and high is missing. Okay, so this is going to be the data set on which we operate. And this is basically the kind of thing that we would use for data mining algorithms. So we use a, a, a standard approach called the, the a priori algorithm. Um, that will build models of the outcomes based on these items that are, that are, that are uh, uh, present or missing. 
Okay, so the classic example is you, know, you go to the go to the store and if you bought peanut butter, you bought jelly. If you bought peanut butter and jelly, you buy bread or something like that. Okay, uh, and so we want to know if you know if you if you, know, you have these characteristics, you know this is high, this is low, you failed. This is high, this is you know whatever you, you passed. Uh, and then you can use these association trees to you know analyze them for clues to fault location. Um, we think you can also do some other interesting things, like for example, maybe you can run in-house test cases against these models and try to try to figure out if your in-house test cases are failing in ways that, that are, are similar to way that, the ways that they're failing out there in the field. So this may help to reproduce problems, huh? So, so you're, um, you're trying to uh, collect the pass and fail rate and put it in the number here and decide the, the range. Or you, normally, when, when we have a test case, right, we, we only have two answers, either fail or pass. Right, right, right. So this, so how do you map this result to the like the, the M and the K? Okay, so the so in, in this in, in what we did here, the outcomes are exactly what you said. You passed, it failed. The run passed, run failed. The the measurements are things like you know this line of code was executed 37 times on this run. Okay, uh, this measure, this this function was called you know 132 times, and you can do other kinds of things as well. You know, whatever you could imagine measuring about a, a program. You can make those one of the measures. All right. So what comes back to us is a big vector that has measurement number one and a value, measurement number two and a value, et cetera, uh, and then the outcome pass fail. So each each measurement is against one particular code, code section. Against one, yeah, against one particular measurement point in the program in this case, right? So we imagine just we stuck a probe right on line 27, and we captured something, and it, that could be could say something about control flow plus data values. I mean, you could be whatever you want. All we, all we looked at in this case was statement counts and, me, and, and method counts. But there's no reason you couldn't use other things as well. Okay. And so, so um, what we do is we say, you know, we set up beforehand, these are the things that we, we, we would like to measure or we could measure about the system. And then we'll sample that and we'll say, and in this instance, we're going to measure this one, this one, this one, and this one, but not these other ones. Okay. Okay, so we applied this to a system called Java, which is a Java bytecode analyzer. It's about 60,000 lines of code, 400 classes, 3,000 methods. We had 707 test cases, 14 versions um, with, with real faults in them. And we measured method entry and block execution counts. And again, we ran this on our 120 CPU grid. Um, and what we did is we used something called random forest. So we just used a standard classification where we, we, ca we captured all of the measurement points for all of the programs. And we ran uh, this uh, um, the the remote for, uh, sorry the random forest approach, and that's going to that's going to be our measurement of truth, right? So that's sort of with all the data, how well could we characterize uh, pass or fail? Okay, if we measured everything on every program, how well could we we uh, we measure uh, could we predict pass or fail? And in this case, basically, we had perfect models, although there were some outliers. So how long does it take to do that full run? Um. You know, I'm not sure because uh, one of my co-authors ran this um, himself, and I'm not sure the exact numbers that that, that we did. Um, we did that, but tests. well, it depends. So it's, it's 700 test cases against uh, against the 14 versions, and uh, the tests are I don't know a couple minutes long okay. to yeah you know, something like that. It's not you know this is this, this, this you know this particular example is not you know yeah. 10 years of, of, of work. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, so do, uh, to collect the measurement, do you have to inject some code artificially? Yes, you do. In, th in this case, so, so um, uh, now again, because this was just method entry and block counts, this is effectively like running a subset of like GCOV on it. We just have, you know, how many times did I, did I execute this statement? So there's just a little counter, you know, you know hit count plus plus here, okay? And that's all we put in there. There's no, uh, in, our, in our case, there are no guards on this. There no, there's nothing that says, you know, Turn it on or turn it off or whatever. It's just we're going to stick it in there, and it, you're either going to use it or not. I mean, if we if we use it, we stick it in there. If we don't, we take it. We leave it out. Okay. Uh, but 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 the overhead on this for for this um, uh, for the for the measure for for the method counts especially was was basically nil. For the statement counts, they're really they're really block execution counts, a little bit higher, but still in the in the couple percent, and, and that's on the full data. Okay. If we if we measured everything, it was in a couple percent. Okay. Um, so some, so, so some, stamp, some sample results. Basically what I've got here, um, let's see here. So this is with the method count data and this is with the block count data. And there are four things we measured. Now one thing I, maybe I forgot to tell you is our technique will, pr will predict pass, 
fail or I don't know. All right. So, so if we have conflicting rules or we can't, we don't have a good a good uh, answer, we can say I don't know. So coverage says how many times was I able to make a prediction, yes or no, versus I don't know. All right. So in this case, we've got about you know, 85, 86 percent coverage. So on 85 percent of the runs, I could say this is going to this was a passing run, this was a failing run, and in 15 percent of the cases, again on the average, I I, I didn't know. Okay. And that's, what, that's, that's basically where, where we get our no free lunch here. right? This is where we have to pay something for not measuring everything. Okay? Um, now, for, for the, the cases where we could uh, do a classification, you can see that misclassifications overall, false positives and false negatives, are in the couple percent. Okay? So I think, and, and this is for both the, and for the method counts, it's a little bit, a little bit worse than for the, the block counts, but for the block counts, we're... So I don't understand. What's the difference between misclassification, false positive, and false negative? So a false positive is, I said this was positive, it's a, it's a failure, right? False negatives, I said it was negative, right? And then misclassifications is both, right? I, whatever I said it was, it wasn't or it was, right? Whether I said, so sometimes you can have a bias, right? So sometimes, you know, you can, uh, to get very good overall uh, uh, answers, you can predict, you could predict everything is, is a passing run, right? Because these things fail fairly, fairly. Um, oh, I see. So you you, oh, so misclassification is more like the don't know. No, miscla so, so misclassification is when I made a prediction, did I make the right prediction? No matter what the prediction was. So I, I say this is a passing run. You know, was it? Oh, so is misclassification a union of the false positive and false negative? Basically. Oh, okay. Basically. I was looking at those as <coughs> mutually exclusive. No, so the second column is a is a summary of the third and fourth columns. Yes, yes. Although you have to realize there, there are many more positives than negatives, so it's not, yeah, you know, it's not a simple uh, average, right? I see, but, but these aren't independent. So the second no. column is dependent, is a function of, okay. Right. Okay. Although in each case, yeah. there are different numbers of, of passing and failing and okay. whatever. Okay, so it's not, it's not, you can't just, you know, stick them together and get an answer, yeah, yeah. right? Okay. Um, but the point, okay, so the main takeaway is here. This is competitive with our standard methods where we use exhaustive data. Although we uh, measured only between 5 and 8% of the data in any one instance. And to make up for this, we actually we had about four times as many instances overall. Okay, so we, we collect less data per instance, but we have to use a few more instances to, uh, uh, to, to get the coverage. Okay? Um, all right, some, some a partial summary here. So we, we basically argue that we created highly effective models at a greatly reduced cost compared to what we did with the exhaustive data. Um, other uh, findings, there's a lot of redundancy in the data, which is, which is very interesting. So, it's, so we didn't have to find the, ex the, the one right place to measure the system. There are actually a lot of right places to measure the system that will help us to understand or predict whether a, a run passed or failed. Uh, clearly, we need to replicate this in other systems. This is just a very preliminary piece of work at this point. Um, looking at the difference between the method counts and the, and then the block execution counts, uh, it seemed like the technique scales very well to the larger systems and at, at, at with the more data we were able you know we we're also able to bring down the number of uh, we've been able to push this down into the one percent and lower uh, per instance measurements and we still get very good results so ongoing uh, uh, projects you know we we need to do some more theoretical uh, exploration of this approach there are some competing methods in particular uh, Ben Liblet at, at Wisconsin has an interesting technique similar to ours but but different in some ways and we really kind of want to understand better how, ours, how, our, how our approach compares to his and to others, uh, and what kinds of failures can we actually detect or not detect given that we're, we're using this uh, partial measurement approach. Um, how many instances do we need to observe? How, you know, how few instances per, how few, how few measurements per instance can we, uh, can we go? These are some interesting questions. So, uh, so a recent piece of work that we did was, was also starting to look at some alternative utility functions. So in the, in the work that I just mentioned, uh, we gave extra points to measurements that had a high correlation with outcome. Okay? Uh, in, in a follow-on piece of work, what we said is, well, let's also factor in how often that measurement probe was executed. Right? So give us a sense of the cost of putting that measurement, uh, of collecting that measurement. And what we were able to, we were able to come up with a, actually a slightly better approach, a slightly better performance at 1 50th of the cost by giving, giving uh, more weight to predictive measures on low execution paths than to, to uh, predictive measures on high execution paths. So um, we thought that was uh, really interesting because it gets down, the, the, the overhead becomes effectively nothing in this, in this example here, uh, which is very nice. 
Uh, and then new applications. We also want to look at can we apply this, can we use this stuff to, to do this lightweight test oracle issue we looked at before. In other words, can we, can we try to see if, if um, uh, failures that we, can, can, we re, uh, can we reproduce failures in-house that look like the, the failures we're seeing out there in the field and can we use this to kind of give us a sense of reproducing failures that we see out in the field. Um, we, we haven't done that yet, we're looking at that. And also maybe we can use this idea to also cluster failure reports. You know, are, these, are these problems we've seen before, uh, basically because the model's coming back, do they look like models that we've seen before or are they different? Okay, um, so let me just wrap up here with some ideas about future work. Uh, you know, obviously we're always looking for more example systems and more, uh, more ways to use this, uh, this, the, our, our techniques. Um, I'd like to talk to people if you've got any, any thoughts on that. Um, we definitely want to get into some new uh, program, uh, new problem classes. We're starting to look at the question of how do you, um, how do you do QA for dynamically reconfigurable systems, especially how do you certify these? So you've got systems that physically move them, you know, move the processor to the process to processor mappings at runtime. Uh, and what does this mean for like military enterprise systems or other things that have to be, or avionics systems that have to be certified? Can we can we do anything to to um, uh, to leverage this this sort of you know large uh, QA um, uh, approach to do a better job with that um, cost optimization? So especially this I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but especially where we've got um, test environments in which the platforms themselves have to be recon or can be or, or should be reconfigured. Um, you know how do we factor all those things in and get a, 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 a good cost optimized QA process? Another thing that Tom and I were chatting about this morning, um, if you have component-based systems where each of those systems is, is part of a DCQA process, you know, what can we do to essentially compose or link these, these multiple models and processes together to do interesting, um, essentially leverage the fact that the multiple higher layer uh, components are using lower level components and things like that. And I think that's a very interesting, uh, very interesting thing to, to look at. Um, other things, we clearly want to integrate our approach with some test generation ideas. So as we give more ability to run more tests, um, if we're limited by manual touch labor of writing and, 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 uh, and creating tests and, and executing them, well, we can take out the execution, but, it, but if the manual writing and, and generation of the tests is, is our, may become our bottleneck. So we're talking, uh, we have the, the guitar system. There's Atif Memon at the University of Maryland who's got some work on uh, test case generation. I know uh, you guys are doing some here at Microsoft Research as well. Um, we're also working with Dr. Schmidt at uh, Vanderbilt where they are looking at um, using some model driven engineering ideas to generate essentially dummy worker components to help do more load testing and stress type testing and things like that. And how can we integrate that into our, uh, our DCQA approach um, to, do a, to do a good job there. Especially in systems where with you know, long lived systems where you know, it takes a while to phase in the components. Um, and then finally, we want to work on some improvements to the skull system itself. In particular, right now, we're sort of limited to an idea that a test runs on a, a single client out there in the world. But for distributed systems where we're going to need multiple clients that work together to, to actually execute the test, um, we're going to need some updates to our approach to, to deal with that. And we're, we're starting to look at that. Uh, and then finally, in talking to more um, uh, companies and stuff, it's, it's becoming clear to us that Many companies have their own deployment engines for uh, setting up the tests and, and distributing them to clients and executing them. Where we're really adding a lot of our value is in this, is in this upper layer of strategy and coordination and algorithms. Um, and so maybe what we really need to start thinking about is coming up with some kind of interchange format that would allow SCOL to run on top of other people's lower level systems. For example, Cruise Control or BuildBot or um, SmartFrog or some of these other deployment engines or even your own homegrown deployment engine. Uh, I think we don't want to be in the business of trying to recreate those things that people already have. Um, it's, it's a waste of our time and other people can do it a lot better than we can anyway. So uh, I think what we need, to, we need to sort of look at how we can split SCOL and, and sort of you know, focus on our high, high value added part. Uh, and let and, and let that work with uh, lots of other lower level engines. Okay, okay, that's uh, all I had to talk about today. Um, can I take a question or two? Yes. So the, for the distributed QA, um, I'm trying to think about the. You have a server, you have a client, right? So how do you define the client? So how do you uh, how is the test executed on the client? Okay. So you are, you expect the client to execute the test case and send back the report. Yes. The case? Yes. So what we have. Um, like, again, with our like, A-style examples, right? We basically have 
project specific build scripts and execution scripts. So the, the project has to give us those and we just basically execute them through a kind of service oriented architecture that we talked about where we say when, when the client tells you, you know, uh, deploy, uh, configure the system, um, you know, we're going to give them the actual code that has to be executed on, on the client end to do that. Okay. And I don't, I don't see that we're going to be able to get around that because we want to work with lots of different projects. So the, the projects themselves are going to have to do this. And for a lot of these multi-configuration systems, you know, you have to build multi-platform build scripts and test scripts anyway. But, but, but the, I, guess, I guess there's, so there's lots of different models. So is, in your model, is that client machine like dedicated to you? Because like, you know, an issue is if it's being used for other tasks. Like at Wisconsin, they had Condor. Right, where you could say, I, I've got this big set of tasks. You know, I want to run this executable on these 100,000 different files. And I don't have enough resources, so I've got a local area network with a bunch of machines. Please right. run this thing for me. And, you know, it, it, the idea was idle workstations. Yes. So, so, so I guess what, what, what are you assuming sort of about, I mean, what, I mean, what is the distribution mechanism and, and sort of, uh, what are the assumptions about okay. sort of these so, nodes? Right, so we're not making any, we don't want to get into reservation systems or some of the sandboxing issues like Condor and stuff like that. Uh, and, and in some cases that doesn't even work for us because we want to actually s send messages and you know, use ports and things like that that, that uh, Condor doesn't really want to let you do. Right. Um, it really depends on what you're trying to do so if, and, and where you are, right? So like in the last work here with the, the code level fault modeling stuff, we really expect that to run on end user machines. Okay, so we're not going to we're not making any claims about uh, what other processes are running on the machines. Um, you know, we're not uh, we're, we're not we don't not going to run this as a screensaver or, or whatever, right? Because that's not what we want. We want this to be on an, an actual executing system, and that's the way that goes. If you want to do stuff that requires uh, recompiling, you know, or changing the OS or whatever, um, you know, you just can't do that on an end user machine. You have to, you know, you're going to have to do something smart about that. So we don't make any. Um, so, so the process of like packaging up your executable and tests in such a way that it can be distributed and run on another machine that that's that's sort of more of the project specific. That's more project specific, okay. And 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 so for example, one other reason for wanting to use some of these other lower level engines is they they actually do deal with some of these issues better than we do. What right? about innovation? And then though with like test test management. So like at Microsoft, we have like test management, you know, infrastructure. Right, which again, you have a set of test machines, you have a set of tests. I mean, how, how do you see this integrate? I mean, clearly this, like if we were gonna try to use these sort of ideas here, where, where, would, it most, where would it fit best architecturally? Sort of like in a test management? I, 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 think that's, I think that's, well again, it depends what you do, but I mean, I would see that the, most of the stuff I talked about here would work best in the test management side. Um, you know, some of the stuff with the code level fault monitoring, that's really stuff you want running out there. Yeah. At, you know, at the user site. So I think it really depends on, on what you want to do. Um, and we haven't really dealt with all with, you know, we haven't really dealt with all those issues, especially in terms of like secu in security yeah, and some yeah. of those ideas. We just we're not at really at that point. Um, but I think yeah, I think I think in, for example managing big test labs is, is an area where we really ha are getting a lot of interest uh, as one. Uh, yes. Okay. Oh, question. So right now what you've uh, been experimenting with is systems that are really are relatively well contained within the box that you're giving the instructions to. Yes. And they feed back information to you. So they tell you in advance, this is what my configuration is, and right, right. Uh, you tell them what to do. So one of the things that you're thinking about in order to adapt that to having um, tests of client server applications, where now you have to collect data from this in real time to find out what its communications environment is like, and you have to collect data from the server side to find out what the impact is of all these different things coming in. Right, right, right. Well, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of good ideas yet on that yet. We have, we've really limited what we're doing to things that can run on a single server. And, and where they've not, it's, it's, it's still been forced through a single server that then would do its own redeployment of stuff. And so, um, you know, I haven't really given that a lot, a lot of, of thought. Um, you know, what we've done has all been homegrown stuff and, uh, and assume that, like for example, the, the Ace and Dow stuff, they have to measure this performance, so we use their tools to do that, okay? Um, but... Uh, right, so one way to generalize it would be to a service. So like, if, if, if we wanted to do something like this, on, although maybe, maybe, 
I don't know, maybe it doesn't make as much sense, but yeah, I mean, if you think about like a three-tiered architecture or something like that, front-end machines, business logic, back-end. Right, right. So well, uh, so so that thing. Keep part of it fixed and then vary the others. Sure, sure, sure. Well, and there's, there's uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of ways you might want to do this, and I think it really depends on, you know, question specific stuff. Uh, but I was going to make a point that, like, for example, with the with the cuts work here that I talked about from Vanderbilt, some of these, you know, how do you measure latency or whatever? These things are are primitives that are built into their modeling language, and they generate the code with the primitives built in. Right, so you can, if you want to know, I want to know uh, what's the latency between this point and this point, they will actually, you know, write the glue code that, that does that and wrap it around their, their components and send it out. So I think, uh, I think there are some ways to, to look at that. I don't know that I would want them rolled into to skull. I mean, I'm not sure, right? Uh, I, I guess the other thing is um, there's, there's, I, there, I noticed there was some work uh, conference recently looking at how do you put measurement infrastructure on clusters? So as, as clusters become more and grids become more uh, experiment platforms and stuff like that, you're going to want to build these into them. So uh, there may be, that, that may be a way to, to look at this more as, as services that are provided by the machines themselves or the, the, the grids themselves than by something we do. But, but really that's not where, where we really focused at this point. That's a great question though. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks. Okay.